Uh, yeah, so just, I suppose, the soft ball, or just test team, just break a squad. Um, the Liam Trasnet here, a cock on you, how Tracy show us new more. Dorira, how she, how she fear hoped up early in the marsh, how cool me they talk to Kayla, she egged, the extra shin tree, star, new red egg and dela, um, Massam Hainik, which I re hoped up the lady. And so I just want to thank, um, Liam Trasnet here, everyone, for, for making all this kind of stuff happen because I think, especially in these days, it's, it's just so important we come together, regardless of what we're coming together about. But, the fact that we have this in common and that this has been set up, I think it's just fantastic. Um, so we're here tonight to talk about um, Bayes Rat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump straight in here because I don't want you looking at my ugly face for the entire evening. Um, so I hope everyone can see that. Uh, so Ron Voig, what we're looking at tonight is Bayes Rat in County County. So Ron Voig, County County. Okay, so the excavations took place back in 2007 as part of the M9 motorway which was coming through the bypass, the likes of Waterford, coming all the way bypassing Kilkenny, Carlow, all the way up along towards Dublin. So this particular site, I suppose, as an archaeologist, I mean, you get to excavate and jump into history all over the country, but it's very rare that you get to actually dig somewhere that's within a couple of minutes of your own house where you grew up. So for me, this was, I suppose, a, a real treat when I found out that I was going to be on it. And ever since, it's something that's, that's stuck with me. Um, I think as Irish people, we have this thing where it's, it's said so many times about the sense of place. This sense of place that we have as Irish people, I think, is something that, you know, I don't think is replicated in other areas. And it's something that it draws you back every single time. And if you're lucky enough to live in the area that you grew up, it's an understood feeling amongst you that it's community, it's togetherness. And when you're not, as I am, living in the area that I grew up in, you, you can't describe that feeling. It's not just familiarity. It's not just driving back down the road and feeling like it's a familiar setting. It's more than that. It's more deep rooted than that. So Ron Boy, for me, really, in terms of the place, before all towns and, and county boundaries and all that were imposed on top of us, this was the real community around which my own community was built. So for that reason, it reflects every other community in the country, wherever you're listening from tonight, if it's Galway or Tip or Donegal or wherever. It, it, it's reflected across the entire country. So Ron Vohig, the first thing we're going to look at is the name, Ron Vohig. So when we first jumped into the area, we had to look and see what exactly we were dealing with in terms of what existed around the site. So Ron Vohig, the name, first off, um, it, I suppose it, in terms of various like forts, if you're looking at Dunvor, you know, on Lismore, the Lahedish and Dunvjelg, they're very easy to work out, large forts, small forts, those kind of things. But Ron Vohig, it has a, it's all rooted in the language and you're going to hear me saying that a lot tonight rooted in the language so Ra, the Ra, we all have noticed that the, the Ra in the field everyone's heard about it Ra and Vohig Boshta or Boshta it, it, it was to do with water to do with water from the earth now Boshta being a christening Boite Boite Sanishka so from the excavation experience we found that actually it came true we were absolutely soaked in water from the very moment we got onto that site, only till we started to leave did it start to dry up. And that was only because the weather was starting to get better. So from the moment we started to excavate that site, we would literally, we could dig a ditch five foot down and you could leave that same ditch in the evening. And the following day, you come back to that ditch and it could be filled with five foot of water. And this happened every single evening. You'd have to come back on site. You'd have to bail out the water with your sponge, take your bucket, fling it out, clean off your section that you were working on the day before and go again. And this was happening with every single site that we had. So eventually we had to run a pump to get the water out of there so that we could actually get some work done. And it was all right in the warmer days, but when it started to get into the winter and these features were freezing over in front of your face and then you had to break the ice, stick the sponge in to bail it out, you know, the experience of every single person who excavated on that site was that it was on the We were absolutely covered in water. So the, the the other two sites that existed in the area, I'm going to just do a quick jump into at the moment. So the route we're talking about here again is Noctover. Anyone who's familiar with Noctover, that general area, if you're coming from Waterford going to Dublin along that motorway, when you're exiting off where Noctover is, that's where we're looking at. And it was situated on Gorey's Farm. So Gory's farm, Mrs. Gory was an absolute dote. She was lovely. Every single day, Mrs. Gory came up with a tray of biscuits and a cup of tea for every single one of us on the site. And she was so interested in what we were doing. Even when it came to Christmas, she was coming up with mulled wine. And I had the pleasure of meeting her daughter not too long ago. And she said she never took a drink in her life. So that's why the mulled wine had that little bit more of a kick off of that we, were, we weren't used to. So now we're looking at the, the aerial shots, or at least I hope we are. I could be just looking at it on my own, but I think you're all looking at it with me. 
So the aerial shots of, of the, the site, what I've come to experience is that if ever you want to entertain an Irish crowd, put up an aerial photograph. It's, it's a fact. If you stick an aerial photograph up, you could spend hours talking about it, especially if the people know where you're looking at. And this particular area here, you know, I've made the cursor a bit bigger. This is the site we're talking about here, Rowan Volk. This is Bay's, Bay's Rath here. This is Gory's Farm. And in the area, we have an existing ring fort here, which is Rahin. And we also have Dangan Vilk up here, Dangan Beg, another existing ring fort. And in the ring fort that we're going to be talking about here in Bay's Rath, Rowan Volk existed only in name. Now, Ring forts. Why are there so many ring forts around? Why are they one of the most common field monuments that we find around Ireland? What is, what's the reason behind that? And I can hear you all saying it. If I asked the question, I bet you every single one of you would tell me the same thing. Who lives in, the, in, who lives in a ring fort? Who lives in them? The fairies live in them. And that's exactly it. The fairies are the one thing that are preserving these ring forts because the stories that have come along through the years, from your grandfather, your grandmother, all the way back, is being warned about the Ra. Don't go into the Ra. By God, Jimmy there. Jimmy was cutting wood in the rad there one day, and I tell you, Jimmy wasn't around too long after. And we've all heard those stories. Everybody has heard those stories. I've been told those stories, and for that reason, there's a ran not far from my house, and I still won't go into it. And it's the same thing that you'd hear. I just I wouldn't believe in the fairies, but but I wouldn't cut down a fairy tree. You know, and this is the kind of thing you're talking about. It's it's in, in all of us, this understanding that okay, maybe there's this modern view and slant on the fairies now, but I'm still not going to mess with it. And no more so when we look at these types of stories is that there's never an ending really to them. There's never a conclusion. You never really know what happened to the person who got caught up with the fairies. And if you look at along with the ring forts, there's often stories of lads getting picked up in the middle of the night by the fairies as he was walking past a ra. And then he was dropped back by the fairies the following day. But you never hear what happened to the person after. So it's the unknown. And that is the beauty of these stories is that the unknown is something we don't have any more in these stories and the generations that are coming are, are losing the connection with these stories and here at Ray, Ram Vaig in Bay's Rat we have these two here Rahin and myself Liam and Kanasiki I think who's in, tuning in tonight we walked up to Dangan Vig here who's on his family's land okay now we're three grown men and the three of us I've never seen three more nervous looking fellas walking up to a rat in all of my life neither one of us wanted to go inside in the thing and this, you know, myself and Liam now, we wouldn't be anyway on the GA pitch. But Candice now has a few inter-county medals, and he was even dodgy about going in there. So we stood around for a few minutes, but eventually we walked in. We took the measurements, and it pitched roughly around the same size as the ring fort that we found here. These three ring forts is sitting in the shadow of a fairly serious piece of folklore in terms of this little hill here. So you see here, Knuff and Dryan, Rock and Knock Adrina, it's called. And everybody, again, I'm sure all of you out there, if I was standing with you in person, I bet you'd come back with the same. On Dryan, Round Dryan, Knuff and Dryan, the Hawthorn. We all know the importance of Hawthorn. We all know what it's about. We all know, you know, it's the fairy tree. Okay, we know that. This is the fairy tree. The Hawthorn is a, is a dark black wood, it's a hard wood. And it's one of the things that's through our, our, our stories and our mythology going way, way, way back. And if we look at where these ring forts here are situated in the shadow of this Knuff and Dryan, Knock and Drina, they're sitting in the shadow and have done for as long as. So this particular place here holds something that you can't quite touch, you can't understand. So I always, when I'm looking at these, I'm thinking of the stories that were handed down in the site here, happening around the heart, as we all do, even at Christmas as a family. Where do we gather? We gather around the heart. It's the fire, it's, it's, it's the simple place where we all gather as one. It's a very simple thing. Even people who are putting stoves in the houses, the first thing they'll say is, oh, but I miss the flame. I miss having a few flames. The reason you miss having a few flames is because of the sense of connection. And I can only imagine what I must be sitting around the heart down in Bayswrath, being told by your father and your grandfather about the goings on up in Knuff and Dryan and the fairy lore and the various things that go on up there and not to go up there. What happens if you do go up there? Now, Knuff and Dryan, Dryan, the word itself, Hawthorn, like I said, we know it's the fairy tree. We know how important it is in all of our, our folklore and our mythology and our stories. But no more so than even today, when we look at the site itself, it's imposing, it's there, it's, it's, it's within all of what's going on here. It's, it's taken up its place in the landscape which has to be looked at. This archaeology is not just about the ground and what's looking straight at your face. It's the landscape. You have to read the landscape. And Dryan itself, the Hawthorn, 
when you look at the stories, even looking at the likes of uh, Dermot and Grania, for example, when, when Saif picks a slow from the hawthorn bush and she eats the slow and straight away she falls pregnant. All, already we're seeing a fertility symbol there. And this child grows up, but it grows with a lump on its, on its forehead. And when it comes to grow into a man, this lump splits and the serpent spits out of his head and Khan Kael Kahl, Khan of a hundred battles comes along and he slays the serpent. Again, dark, black magic, all of this stuff that's wrapped up in the drying. And when you're looking at even today, we see the likes of this, this kind of a tradition that is just, it's a local tradition. It's a local tradition that exists and lives on because it's been passed down. And we see here, what have we got? We've a wayside cross. We all know what the wayside cross is. We're surrounded by historians tonight. The wayside cross in the middle, on the, on the junction of a crossroads. We see them in masonry. We see them and in wood. And here in a little small place in Kilmore in Wexford, I'm sure some of you know it, there's the wayside cross. Now, every single one of these is made from the wood of the coffin of the person who's passed on. Now, this person is the remnants of the wood, the wood that wasn't used. The family create the wayside cross that you see here, and they then strap it to the tree that's closest to the crossroads. What tree is it? It's Andrian. It's the hawthorn tree. Why is that one picked? Why was it picked? And why has this tradition been there for centuries? We see on the right over here, 1999, okay, we're going back away. What have we got stuck here next to the motorway? We've got a fairy bush. In the middle of all of this modern chaos, roundabouts and motorway, we have a fairy bush. That fairy bush was the cause of this motorway being moved. It cost 100 million euro to get this thing moved away from the fairy bush. That shows you the importance that we have with this drying, with this folklore, something that we're losing and it's slipping, but it's there and it's important that we hang on to it. So when we get back into Bayes Rat, we get back into Ron Voig, talking about the excavation. When you're excavating a site and when you've done all of the various bits that you need to do, you get your post-excavation map. So you get an idea of what you're looking at. Now, looking at that there now, it doesn't look like a whole lot. So what I'm going to do when we're looking at Bayes Rat, is I'm going to have a quick look at what we found, pick on some of the different date ranges and move our way through as best we can without jumping into it too much and going into too much detail. Okay, so the first few things that we see on this site, in this particular area here, we have what's left here. This is our ring fort, okay? And over in this site here, we've got phase upon phase upon phase of activity. The earliest of activity that we have on the site is the late Neolithic, okay? So the late Neolithic is just junctioning into the early Bronze Age. What are we talking about? Roughly, give or take, in or around 2,500 BC, okay? So that's the date range we're looking at. So the late Neolithic, we're looking at a time where they're depositing into the ground, okay? So before any of this is happening here, there is a group of people who are coming to Bayes Rat to deposit into the ground. Now, we have a culture in this country of we worship sky, we worship the ground. And when you look at worship in the sky, you look at all of the various passage tombs. We speak about Nakro, we speak about Brunaboyne, we speak about all of these passage tombs which worship the sky. Here at Bayes Rat, we see a ritual deposition with a particular group of people of eight pits. So there's eight pits that have got cremated bone inside. Okay, now within that cremated bone, we've also got little bits of these pottery. Now, this is the pottery when it's lovely and put together and looking as it should look. These are the fragments of the same pottery. Now, this pottery is beakerware. Okay, now the beaker pottery is across Europe. It's everywhere. And it's up until in the third millennium BC. You see it. It stretches across as far down far as, as North Africa, from the Danube all the way to Ireland, up into Scandinavia. You're seeing this beaker pottery. It's a beaker people. That's how we know them. It's based on the pottery that they're using. These fragments are showing up in Bayes Rath in our country, in or around that time of the late Neolithic. So they're depositing in the ground, but they're depositing fragments of this beakerware. And they're also depositing fragments of bone, not, not a whole lot of bone, but, but fragments of bone. And in within that, with that, that, that position, what you're also getting is fossils. So they're picking these fossils. Why are they choosing these fossils to be deposited with this beakerware and this cremated bone? So these people are coming and they're depositing into the ground. Okay, so this beakerware, when you're looking at, okay, how, how does this fit into the whole story? Why is this important? In Ireland, we've got two very, very different types of beaker deposition. Up in the north, it's all to do with megalithic tombs. Everything up there seems to be some form of connection to a megalithic tomb. But in the south, and we see then single deposits, single deposits of cremated bone with some sort of ritual element with a fossil, with some 
types of tools with their flint and lithics and things like that deposited with the cremated bone. And this is the first, the very first type of evidence we see at Bayesrat, the very first piece of this fascinating puzzle that's about to stretch for nigh on three and a half thousand years without any break in activity. Now, this is the whole starting point. So that's what we're looking at here. If we get that in your head, two and a half thousand BC, roughly is where we're looking. Okay, so as we move on, where do we go next? This is the layout of the site. Okay, now I want to kind of go quickly through it and I'm going to go back in in a bit more detail for each of these. Now again, to try and figure out that this was this was excavated in 2007. It was excavated at a time when possibly not the best in terms of economy, we're just about to fall apart. So maybe a lot of this stuff, because of the way in which it all fell through in the economy, wasn't really heard about at the time. We've got the site here and all of this down here is our settlement. This is where all of our settlement is going. What I mentioned there about the deposition, that's happening just here. And then all of a sudden, in the, in the late Bronze, in the early Bronze Age, what we see then is people beginning to build on the site. So starting to construct little roundhouses. And what we see on the south, these little roundhouses again with attached roof, the mud walls, and then from there, the site starts to grow. And we've got this colossal ring, as you can see here, this big ring going all the way around, 41 meters across. And it's an Iron Age palisade. This Iron Age palisade is basically a massive wooden fence. Okay, so what we've gone from here is an open way of living. So this Bronze Age settlement that we see with no kind of enclosures, no real divisions. But then all of a sudden in the Iron Age, we start to see a division, an enclosing of the settlement. Now this Iron Age that we see and this palisade that we see is 41 meters across. And you say, well, how does that make, how does that fit in with the, the layout of the site? Everything else that stems from here is based in that one area. So from this Iron Age, we start to see more ritual context up here. So this line across the site here, everything up on this side is ritual. Every single bit of it is ritual. Everything down here is settlement. In between, we have all these divisions and plow marks and crops being grown and animals being kept in this place, as well as kilns for drying the corn. We have little pits for smelting iron. Everything is going on in this one place. And not only is it is it going on for a, a couple of generations, it's going on for generation after generation after generation. We're talking here, we, we could be talking about 60 generations of families on this one site, stretching from that late Neolithic right up until the early medieval period in Ireland. We see so much difference in transition at a time of massive change in our country, all in this one site. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do a, a quick look at that palisade okay so this is the palisade you can see us here excavating the, the inside of the palisade this massive ring that we see around here that's the iron age palisade now the palisade shows up like that so a series of post holes okay so in terms of archaeology i'm sure there's some of you out there that are completely familiar with it but when you're excavating what you're trying to do is take all of the fill from the cut that was made in the ground so whatever cut was put into the ground the fill that then is inside that cut that's your archaeology that's the stuff that you want. That gives you the dates, it gives you the seeds, it gives you all the stuff that you can use to put the puzzle together. Within those post holes, what do we see? We see the water. There it is, back again. Ron Volhig, Boita Sinishka. Come on, Boita Sinishka. Heimpel na Erfad. You can't get away from it. It's everywhere. With these post holes, what you see is roughly something that looks like that. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly what it looked like because you would most likely not have had this massive dish, but this is the kind of structure we're talking about. So when we look at this here and you see these post holes, that's the type of structure that we're talking about, these series of post holes in one line, okay? Now, with this and with this Iron Age palisade, inside of it, again, we have structures. We've got four fairly decent structures within the Iron Age palisade. Again, this is just to give you an idea. I'm not saying this is what they look like, but this is the type of stuff that you'd be dealing with within the palisade, the type of structure that we're looking at. We have four definite structures, but there's phase upon phase upon phase, and they're all cutting across each other. And it was really hard to make any real sense of the inside, but we did have four definite structures and then many more. And people often say, well, how, how can you have so many phases within the one? It's the same as what we do now. If you look at any farmland or any farmhouse, you look at the same thing it's the same situation where you've got the old family farmhouse where it's it's maybe rack and ruin and that was the parents place and then their children have built on the same land and that's the mother's place and then from there the kids are coming back and they're building and they're building and they're building we're doing it now people seem to think just because generations have passed that we somehow turn into this you know 
very progressive society, we're exactly the same as we were then. The only difference is our surroundings are changed. And in a, if anything, we're losing a lot of what these people had. Now, within this particular setup, we've got, like I said to you, we've got kilns, okay? And we've got smelting going on, we've got iron being, being worked into tools. What you've got here is the kilns. So you've got stone line kilns, uh, roughly all in all, we had about 12 kilns throughout the entire site that had gone out of use at different times throughout the life of the site. So within this area here, you can see the various different layers of what's been fired in that kiln. Now the kiln, when we examine the inside, what we're looking at there is maybe the last three to four fires of that kiln tops, because before that it would have been cleared out every single time. So as they're drying their corn, they're drying their crops for making their breads and all the types, it's, they're totally self-sufficient. The agriculture and the way in which they're using the land at this point in the Iron Age is fascinating. They're growing crops that are so hard to come by at the time in other parts of the world. And not only that, but the intense heat that you see here in this pit where they're working the iron, they're working the iron, they're smelting the iron, and they're making and repairing the tools all without any real pomp and ceremony about it. It's typical daily stuff just outside of the palisade. So the enclosed area within the palisade at the daily life, the homestead, outside of that, you're seeing the agriculture, you're seeing the types of, of corn being dried, you're seeing the types of, of kilns being fired, and this smelting, these pits, where there's this intense heat, where this stuff has been worked, reworked. And to give you an idea what that might have looked like, when we see these types of things showing up. So we have these spearheads. Now, we look at spearheads, and again, it's quite, it's, it's rough enough looking. But you also then look and think, well, okay, well, what kind of style of spearhead are we talking about here? You know, is, is there something we can we can compare it to? And in this context, there is something we can compare it to, and it's a Roman spearhead. And not only that, but we also have a couple of fairly basic medieval blades, but we have a Roman arrowhead as well. Now, the question then comes, well, how are we talking about a community in remote Kilkenny where they are not only living off the land in an exceptional way, but also this Roman material is showing up. And if it were for not for that slight bit of doubt in people's head of, well, the Romans were never in Ireland, sure. I mean, that's absolute rubbish. The Romans never came across here because they got went up to the pits up in, in Scotland and they got bet so badly up there that they decided to come nowhere over to us at all. But they did. They were here. Whether it be a trade, okay, they might not have set up shop, but there was definite trade missions happening. And you can see that only five kilometers down the road in a place called Stonyford, where there's a Roman type burial. Now, when we say a Roman type burial, we're saying that the style of the burial is in the Roman, the Roman way. So you've a, a kind of a, the, the grave goods, there's a glass bowl within the grave goods. You've got a mirror on the top of that. So people would say possibly a female burial. And within the Nore, the river itself, have been found Roman finds. So it's possible there was trade missions that these Romans were coming across, bringing with them very basic stuff that they considered to be run of the mill and trading with us here in Ireland. And here at Bayes Rath, what do we have? We have a Roman spearhead and a Roman arrowhead. That shows us not only how sophisticated people are in their trade links, but also we see here, we have spelt. Now spelt, you might say today, sure, I can go down to Super Value and get spelt. Well, actually, you can't go down to Super Value and get spelt. Don't go to Super Value and get spelt today. You're not allowed to leave your house. But what you do see here at Bayes Rath is spelt. You see spelt wheat. Now spelt originally from looking back, stems from somewhere around modern-day Iran, okay? That's where you're looking at, in around Iraq, Iran, modern-day Iraq, Iran. That's where it all began its journey and then drifted across the continent and found its way here to Ireland. Now, in one pit in Bayes Rath, we find a quantity of spelt that is far greater than anything that has been found in England, Wales, or Scotland for the entire Iron Age of that time. Now, that is a huge statement to make, but this is the way we, we, we look at this spelt wheat and we see that it's very hardy. It doesn't mind a bit of wet. It doesn't mind a bit of damp conditions. Luckily, in Ron Voig, that's all that was around you was water. So it was perfect. But what you see is that these people are using more spelt wheat here at Bayesrath in this small one community than what's been used in the entire country across the water from us. Now, that is a statement in itself for the time. They're growing this stuff. They're using this. They're cultivating it. And they're drying, as you can see here, as what the kiln would have looked like. This is it when we excavated the stone line kiln. This is a replica, obviously, of what it would look like in action. You've got the flue going, get the heat up, travels up, you stack all your various different corns up in here, and they dry. And luckily for us, some of them get so charred 
that they get preserved so we can have a look and see what they were eating back then. Now that in itself for Bayes Rath, if we can remember that, that this spelt wheat and the fact and, and the amount of it that we found was just, it was fantastic, it was fascinating. And it showed us just how clever these people were and just how well they were doing on the land. These people weren't the bog standard run of the mill people. They were staying on this land generation after generation for a reason. They weren't just doing it because they had to. They were doing it because they were succeeding at it and it was working. So when we move on and we look and we see the, the, the settlement area of it, we see here, yes, we have our Iron Age Palisade. But what happens then is that within this Iron Age Palisade and you have all this settlement, what do you what do you do what's the, what's the next thing we bury we have the ritual element and the ritual element of the site every bit of it happens up here everything happens up here we have this one boundary that drifts across with possibly one way in one way out and we have one structure that we found here with a series of post holes to define walls and a possible entrance the fact that what we see up here is is fascinating and it's, the, it's something for the site that, that it, it's one of the biggest points of the site for me is the ritual element of this site now we in ireland we are told so often you do debt well you do debt well and that's the thing with this pandemic at the moment that it's it stripped us of that it stripped us of that basic irish thing that we do so well and we can't now with this awful thing we can't do debt well and it's something it, it takes the foundations out from under you because this is where it stems from. This is where we're talking about this. We do death well. Why do we do well? Because it's been passed down from generation to generation. That sense of place, the sense of being belonging to somewhere, and the sense of respecting what's gone before. And what we see here with this ritual area of the site, you've got this ring right here. Now, that ring is a Bronze Age burial mound. Okay? Now, within that, you've got a cremation, so a cremated bone within this Bronze Age burial mound. Now that was there on its own for manies and manies a year. And then in the Iron Age, for some reason, they construct this Iron Age ring ditch the whole way around. But what did they do? They respect what's been there before. So the Bronze Age burial mound that we see here and the Iron Age that has spanned that millennium, they're respecting each other. And within that, we've got a kiln and an inhumation in the center of that ring ditch. Right there, you have a kiln, and an inhumation, so an actual burial, a physical burial of bones, a body being buried within the Iron Age ring ditch. Now, that person obviously had to have some sort of standing in the locality. He can't have just been an annual Joe Soap. When we looked at his teeth, because the preservation of the bones of Bayes Rath was shocking, it was terrible, it, it, the, the acidian soil was, was, was so bad that in some instances we only had teeth left over and that's all we could we could really find was teeth but within this area here in the middle of that iron age ring ditch what we see is this fairly prominent character but his teeth were, were were really sharpened to a point in the middle on both sides which means that he was doing something day on day which meant that he had to pull down on the side of his tooth like that on both sides of his teeth because he built it up into a point and that shows that Okay, yes, he maybe had a position of prominence in the locality, but he was working just like everybody else. See, within this burial and in this ritual area, not only do we see the Bronze Age burial mound with the cremation, we then see the Iron Age ring ditch respecting the Bronze Age burial mound, the inhumation and the kiln. We then have an early Christian burial ground traveling around the outside of this space. Now, between that ditch and the first burial on our early Christian burial ground, there's give or take about two to three meters. So there was obviously a bank. There was a bank surrounding this place here. Okay. And then we have an early Christian burial ground, all in all 67 grave cuts, roughly about 40 odd bodies. What you have to look at when you're talking about this is that everything is respecting everything else. It's not like we're saying this happened last week. These people are living on the land since about two and a half thousand BC. They have built and they have lived and then they have buried on this land in that same place from that point to the early Christian period. We're all fairly aware of that the Christian period in Ireland was fifth century when most of the stuff was done. Okay, St. Patrick, if we go with that story, that that is the line of thought on this. Fifth century is when it happened. So these people are transitioning from the old ways, the gods. And it's in our tongue, Hashi Insantonga Efein, Hashi Aundui. All you have to do is look at the 
that look at the calendar. Beltana, Lunasa, Samhain. We look at Ihauna now, like Ihauna, it's Halloween as if it's some sort of an American festival. Ihauna is, is such a powerful festival in the Irish calendar. And Samhain, that transition from the dead and the living. And we see Tinta Chnava, bonfires, Tinta Chnava, bone fires, bone fires. We're burning bones. It's, 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 it's in every bit of our language and it's there and it's just waiting to be tapped into. And when we look at this particular ritual area and this site here, what we see with the early Christian burials is that, okay, they're now respecting the new way, the Christian way. They're burying the Christian way. Everybody is the same, poor, rich, whatever. You're being buried the same way. Not like in the Iron Age where you've got this one individual who's beyond everyone else. You've got everybody on the same playing field in the one area. There's a meter between roughly each of the grave cuts, which means they knew the others were there. So they were burying over a period of maybe 100, 150, 200 years, where each of them knew that the burial that went before was there and they were burying right next to them. So what we're seeing here is a people who are fully aware that the new ways, the Christian ways, are the way forward. But they can't and they won't forget the ancestry of the past and the people that have gone before, for millennium before them. And let's not forget that as we look at this spring ditch here, and we see myself standing right in the middle of it, that these people that were living within this Iron Age palisade were looking exactly at that space. Every single day of their lives, they were staring right up. Both of these places, especially the next ring fort, is on a similar plateau to this ritual space. And that in itself is fascinating. They're living their lives fully aware of everything that's gone before. Every single thing, every single thing of their, their whole existence on this site is up here. And they are looking at it and respecting it. And as they bury, they respect what's gone before. And that for me is one of the most special areas of this site. So when we look a bit deeper into that and the Iron Age ring ditch, we see here the various different things that we found that were deposited in that ring ditch. So here you have the Iron Age ring ditch. Now the colours you can see here is in types of the cremated bone. So the reds, you're getting a high quantity of cremated bone. The yellows and the oranges are reasonable and then not so much anywhere else. Now why are they here? Why is it on this area of the site? We've got two very slight causeways, entranceways, in and out of this ring ditch. Is it that this place is not actually so much about burial? This place in here is not so much about burial, but more about ritual. Are they entering one way, depositing on the way in, just, just an offering of cremated bone, an offering of something that they feasted on, an offering on their way out? Is it like the holy wells that we have today, where we have the traditions, where we, we loop, we go over, around, again, again, we offer a stone, we offer a stone. Is it something along those lines that we see here at Bayesrath? And we see that within this area, there are finds. We're, we're seeing very similar types of of, of offerings in terms of fines, which I'll show you in a minute. We then, this is the Bronze Age burial mound close up that I spoke of. This is our individual that we find in the middle of our Iron Age ring ditch. This is the person of prominence in our Iron Age ring ditch. The preservation was shocking on these bones. It was, it was awful. You, I don't think you could have gotten worse. But the bones themselves on this particular individual, based on where he was on the site, were of a certain amount that we could tell he was male and most likely in his 50s. And again, the teeth was the main point that they were just to a sharp point at the top. So when we look at the offerings within that ring ditch, we have this fine glass bead. Okay, so we have a fine glass bead that we see that's been offered into this ring ditch, again, as part of this process. So when we look back and we see all of the various things on this site, we see our Iron Age palisade. Okay, and then we see from the Iron Age, when they start to bury it, this early Christian period, what starts to come in here is our ring fort. This is Ra on Vohi. This is it. This is the Ra in Bezrat, right here. And when you talk to the locals, everybody remembers it the same way. On Raw Ball, Raw Ball. When they speak about the site, they speak about on Raw Ball. So within this site, you've got the Iron Age Palisade that's been truncated. It's been cut through by this ring fort. Now this ring fort, again, is a new way of living. It's the next phase. It's early medieval in date. It is, a, it, it's, it's, it's the next phase of building. It's just like buying or putting an extension on your house. They're doing it most likely at the same time where they're still living in the palisade and constructing the ring fort. Now we, within the ring fort, could not find 
very much in terms of habitation, but that was purely down to the fact that the site had been so badly ploughed on that area and also the various different the amounts of water we were getting. It just it was really hard to find anything. But that being said, the area itself, you can see, is a, a sign of a, 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 a neck, the next step because everything, the boundaries, all radiate from this ring fort. So everything on the site is coming out from this one area. These divisions here, keeping animals in, keeping the crops separate, rotating the crops, rotating the animals, and all the while burying in the ritual space. And this ritual space is, is the key to everything on this site. You see so much and you can tell so much about the people just from that one area. Within this ring fort, you look and you say, okay, where does this lead? What's the next phase? The next phase isn't there. This is our last move on Bayes Rat. It's early medieval, early Christian. We're talking 5th century, 6th century, 7th century. Sheepstown Church is built down the road. It's a 10th century church. Are they, are they worshipping there at that point? We have no evidence on this site for anything past this particular ring fort. So when we look at these offerings and we look at these things that were these fine beads, this is a lovely glass bead. You see loads of these coming from the likes of Slovenia, Slovakia, places like that. Again, trading. Lovely amber from Scandinavia, the finest of amber, really sought after. Again, traded. When we look at the site as a whole, it is most definitely trading all of the time with all of the various different contacts outside of just this base wrap. Here on the left, you've got this beautiful antler bone cone. And again, really well used. The teeth were worn down on one side. And you've got the stone axe head again, dragging you back to the Bronze Age, the Neolithic, that time of the site. So all of this feeds in to a community that are thriving, not just surviving, but thriving on the site. And we have to look at this in terms of our own, our own localities and what we can take from this. You know, we look at this as just archaeology. It's not just archaeology. And there's so much more to be learned and something that when we look at in greater detail, I'm sure there will be a lot more. And that's something that I plan on doing myself is taking this and trying to get that little bit more out of what's already there and what we've learned already. So when we look and we go back and we look at the site in its glory again and how it's all laid out between this belt between the layout of the site from the early Neolithic to the Bronze Age, to the Iron Age, to the early medieval, and burying all the time, dividing of the site, working of iron, working of the grain, the kilns that's throughout the site. We look at these people and we see these grave cuts and we see, well, okay, there's 67 grave cuts in the early Christian. What's the profile of these people? Who are living on this site? You know, what can we get from that? The preservation of the bone, like I said, was awful, but what we could get was the age range and it seems that from that we have a fairly high quantity of juveniles so in around the you know 8 10 15 kind of bracket and then a fairly high quantity of the elderly adults let's say in terms of at the time 40s 50s but we have no middle adulthood very few one or two and that's all now is that because middle adulthood wasn't a time where people were losing their lives in base rat or is it that they were buried somebody that somewhere else it's, it's an anomaly on the site. Is it that the preservation was of such that we couldn't glean that information from it? Now, of the bodies that we have, the 40-odd bodies, because of the way in which the economy went at the time, the company that were responsible for the site, they were wrapped up. So everything, everything to do with Bayes Rat was deposited with the National Museum. So the bones, everything that we excavated were deposited with the National Museum. So these bones now are in perspex boxes in a storage house in swords and that's where they're going to remain and that's something for me that it never sat right it never sits and i don't think it ever will and i'm, I'm still talking to antiquities in dublin about possibly hopefully trying to get them reinterred and to bring them home. it's a very difficult process and i can totally understand the reasoning behind it because they speak of future surveys and future research into populations in terms of what way people were living in the early Christian period in the Iron Age. But my argument for it was that the preservation of these bones, we gleaned so much and as much as we possibly could from the bones that we had. They really were in a poor state. And I really do believe that it would be so nice for these people to be brought back and reinterred in the place that they wanted to be buried in and not left in a perspex box on the shelf in a storage warehouse somewhere in Dublin. 
that's not ever where they wanted to be left. And it's something that I will always try and work on. And I'm still still working on it to this day, trying to get this somewhere that maybe it, there might be a chance of it happening somewhere down the line. And I'm not sure if it will, but I'm not going to stop trying. And the thing with Bayes Rats in terms of these, maybe there's a personal connection for me there in terms of, you know, I know the I know the area, I'm from the area, and that probably is that sense of place coming back to me again, that if these people were in another area, would I feel as strongly? I'm not so sure. Because when you excavate these bodies, when you're excavating these skeletons, this is emergency archaeology we're talking about here. There was a road going through this site. So only for that road, we wouldn't be talking about it here tonight. So the positives of that is that look at what we found. We found a site that you can see here very clearly that from two and a half thousand BC, there or thereabouts, we have solid occupation and activity and settlement and ritual on this site right up to early medieval times. That is an incredible amount of history and the way in which the site is laid out to show the ritual and the settlement, it is fascinating. The evidence that they have left behind is fascinating. But when you excavate these people and you excavate their bones, you can't but, you can't but try and put some sort of face on them. You can't but ask the question, who were you? What were you like? Who were you friends with? What did you do? It's something that I always found that I always did when I excavated a cell skeleton. I couldn't but try and put some sort of identity on the person. And that for me is something with Bayes Rat that these people not only lived on the land and thrived on the land, but they, they respected it and they understood that sense of place. And long before towns and county boundaries were put on top of us and all of that happened we were living in these small communities and the GAA is an example of that today. These small, tight communities, that sense of place that I don't think we should ever forget about. And the folklore comes into that, the place names, the stories. Tell your kids the stories. Tell them about the fairies. Tell them not to go into a fairy fort. Tell them not to cut down a fairy tree. It needs to stay. There needs to be stories in this country that don't have an ending and that don't have an answer. We can't have the happy answer every time. The fairies can't always have a door on your skirting board. And they certainly, you know, it can't be the, the, the happy endings every single time. There has to be stories in this world that don't have that ending and have to have that element of mystery in order for us to always have that fear in the back of our head, which is, if I do go into that fairy fort, what will happen? And for me, Bayesrat is all the way through a fascinating site. And I really hope that I've brought some sort of light on it, because that was always my goal with this. And through Trust and Atira was just to shed a bit of light on this fascinating site and actually what it means not only to, the, to, to myself and to the locality to Kenny but to every community around the country to show what it's like and what the sense of place actually means because Dor era in Snadini show Vishi Galer Sela Iran Vohig Vishi Fosta Nias Iran Vohig Tibriad or Gokhrui Iran Vohig Vishi Korhe Iran Vohig August is warm winter Eid Kasulam of winter Eid they were they were born in Bezrat they grew up and they worked the land in Bezrat. They died and they were buried in Bezrat. And they are all of our people, not just mine. Gurmil Malgurafad, Slong, August Thurara. Thanks a million, Ben. Hopefully you can all hear me and you can join me in congratulating Ben for an absolutely fantastic lecture. Thank you very much, Ben. Robert Liam. Can everyone hear me? No, I think I've got everybody on mute, so I'm just going to unmute everybody. There you go. Yeah, we can all yeah. mute. You're all it's unmuted. Really good. Ben. Brilliant. Well done. Enjoyed it, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. So it was a wonderful presentation. Yeah, I thought you would have been proud of you, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, Liam, can I ask Ben a question, please? You can ask one. One. Yes. Okay. <laughs> ben, Ben, do you do you think uh, these bones that are hiding away in County Dublin uh, will the fact that they're not interred in Kilkenny will that bring bad luck to the village or to the area? But you know, you see, it's just, when when this presentation, anytime the presentation and lectures I've given, it's always it's always that, that element that sits with people, that the bones and the fact that they're in a perspex box in the shelf, and it's always that element of the, of the conversation that sits with us as Irish people. And the reason for that being is exactly as you say, 
is that we know ourselves, that our own people and ourselves and our own family, the last thing that we would want in a thousand years time is to know that we'd be in a box on a shelf somewhere and that we might be able to just rest in our own locality. And that is the thing. I mean, you, you, you could say it's, it's something in the back of my head anyway. It makes me want to bring them home, whether it's bad luck or not. Um, it just makes us want to bring them home. That, that's really what it is, just to feel that sense of them being at peace. Okay, well, good luck with that. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Ben. And Thank you.